The offseason is finally here. Jake Fisher. Uh, we told you about Jake's book, which I'm almost finished reading. It's right here in my hand. Built to Lose. How the NBA's tanking era changed the league forever. And uh, you can get your copy for the beach this summer. I think Jake is uh, going to be vacationing at the beach. If you want him to sign it for you, he'll be at a Wawa near you. I kid. I don't know that Jake can hear me because I think he would be laughing at my stupid jokes right now. So one thing that he reported at Bleacher Report that I want to get into is he wrote the article about a week ago. He was on vacation last week, so we were going to try to have him on last week, but we got him back this week. NBA League insiders expect a flurry of sign-in trades this summer. And in that, he talks about the Clippers' options. He talks about what the Lakers might do, but also, obviously, the Philadelphia 76ers. All right, I think we got Jake Fisher there. Now, you missed all my good jokes before you came on. You couldn't hear me. I'm sorry, man, but now I have you, so, so you know, we troubleshooted that, quit the browser, and here we are. There we go. You figured it all out. So, uh, Jake is back. I told you his book is called Built to Lose, How the NBA's Tanking Era Changed the League Forever. I'm about halfway done. Okay. About halfway. You know, it's we'll been a long that. summer. I got some vacation time coming up. This will be with me on the beach. And I mentioned you'll be down at the beach. Maybe someone will run into you at a Wawa, and you can get an autographed copy at the uh, Hoagie Fest. Absolutely. I'll be there definitely Labor Day weekend and uh, I think July 30th. So shoot me a tweet if you're down there. And, yeah, we'll, we'll link up. I'll have a Sharpie <laughs> on me and we'll, we'll get you a John Hancock. Yeah, check him out on the Ventnor Beach over there, on a Ventnor Beach near you, Jake Fisher. All right, Jake. Uh, so the season ends last night. Obviously, Giannis is the story. And I'm wondering, in your opinion, how if that championship, Giannis, drafted, stays there, no super team, changes the complexion or is that the anomaly i don't think it changes the complexion at all i mean that's that's the goal of what tanking teams are trying to do right that they're trying to get their superstar through the draft and organically build it and and hope that that player one day attracts other all-stars like drew holiday to stay there long term and then they continue to build a complimentary roster around that core and they dip further and further into the postseason until they're lifting that trophy up at the end of the day i think you know where Milwaukee got really lucky was that Giannis fell to them at 15, and and you know give them credit for taking him where they did, but you know they thought Jabari Parker at number two in 2014 was going to actually be the face of that franchise and be be the number one option on that team. It's a testament to Giannis that he did what he's done and he's worked as hard and he's you know he's saying it last night that you know they're going to do it again next year. This guy's not satisfied, so I think you know. What it does do is it reaffirms that the personality and the int- intangibles about these guys and the intel that these scouts get behind the scenes is just as valuable in the draft and in targeting these superstars than that, that, their talent on the court. Yeah, that's an interesting point is that you wrote about this in the book. You know, they could have had Joel Embiid at number two. They decided to go a different direction. Can you imagine – Joel Embiid and Giannis, I don't know that they could coexist on the same team, but that would have been kind of interesting seeing what Giannis did last night. 20 of his shots came within the, you know, the painted charge area. So um, they have made some mistakes along the way. But while they didn't tank to get Giannis, teams tank to get a Giannis. Yes, yes. And, I mean, the Atlanta Hawks were all over Giannis in that 2013 draft I wrote about in the book. They flew him covertly down to you know, Phillips Arena at the time and, and, and put him up in Danny Ferry's house, their GM then. And, um, you know, Milwaukee just, you know, they were stealthy, that they kept their interest quiet and, and they jumped in and, and selected him at 15. I, I think, you know, he's also a testament that you know, team building is not a straight line. It's, it's an indirect path where, you know, there's going to be all these unforeseen variables that come into play. And they did not expect Giannis to even play for them that first year. They thought he was going to be in the D League, which was before the G League even became a thing, right? Right. So, you know, they get injuries to a lot of people. That's when Larry Sanders, like, got in a fight in some bar and broke his hand and got suspended. But that gave him a lot of time to actually play and grow at that top level. And it really, you know, springboarded him moving on to the future. So I, I think a lot of this stuff, a lot of building towards the future, just like with Philly, right? They did not think they'd be in the situation right now where Ben Simmons is potentially the biggest name available on the trade market in the NBA. They weren't giving him up for Kawhi Leonard back in 2019. So it's just building teams is all about kind of picking and choosing your spots and mitigating unforeseen variables that pop up along the way. 
uh, Jake Fisher, over at Bleacher Report, you uh, wrote a very good piece about how this summer could kind of shape up, and it could be the summer of the sign-and-trade. How prevalent might that be, and how prevalent will Daryl Morey be a part of that? <laughs> Well, I think with Daryl, it depends on, you know, if Kyle Lowry is the, is the answer, is the solution to figuring out this half-court creation hole that the Sixers have. And you know, that's the only way to get Kyle Lowry. They, they don't have the cap space assignment for agency, and he's looking for a big deal. So whether that be with Ben Simmons or, you know, something else with sending back, you know, a younger piece or future picks or whatever, um, you know, that's the only route that Philly can get Kyle Lowry. But there's other situations, too, where – you know, Danny Green, if he gets a, a pricey deal from somewhere else, you know, maybe um, it's a number that he wants that, you know, Miami or, or, or another, you know, team that thinks they're a contender wants to throw at him. But you know, they, they don't they only have a couple more. Uh, they, they don't have a couple million to spare because of their salary restrictions. Remember, the Heat did the same thing with Jimmy Butler and Josh Richardson sending a deal back or a player back. So maybe even losing Danny Green could net a good replacement for Philly. There's a lot of options for Daryl to use that sign and trade clause to make this team better. Is that their only way to get this team better? The sign and trade is that the, like, you know, because they don't have money in free agency. They can't be a player there. So is the tr sign and trade Daryl Morey's really only move? No, I, I think there's going to be a lot of people who are in on Ben Simmons so far. You know, I, I reached out to Minnesota and Cleveland, two teams that were rumored to have, you know, made overtures for him, if you will. And, now, I don't think a deal is getting done in either of those situations where the Sixers are definitely pinpointing wanting to get another all-star caliber player back. Um, you know, maybe that's a Karis LeVert. You know, I've started to hear that he might be available in Indiana, but you know, I, I think they're looking bigger. I think Daryl definitely, you know, I, before I say this, I want to temper everyone's expectations being that he's not available for trade yet, but I think Daryl's absolutely looking at Ben as an opportunity to go and get Damian Lillard. I think he is, but you know we're a long way away from that scenario unfolding. So I would expect Ben Simmons to be in the fold for Philly, you know, deep into August, maybe even. I, I think this is going to be something maybe like that Andrew Bynum trade, not to give Philly fans PTSD, but that developed slowly <laughs> after the Olympics, after you know All Stars came back from playing overseas and, and realizing I want this, I want that. So I think, you know, the fireworks in Philly might take a couple of weeks. They might not happen in the very beginning of free agency. Uh, if Daryl Morey, uh, you mentioned Dane Lillard, does he settle and take a C.J. McCollum? Does that make sense? Or is there a bigger fish? Or does he say, if I can't get the guy I want, I'll just bring Ben back? You know, Portland's in a very similar situation to Houston was with James Harden last year where they know he wants – probably out at the end of the day, but they're open to trying to make some moves to keep him there because he's at least slightly open to staying there too. So the biggest piece on the flip side of that potential Ben Simmons to Portland deal is Portland thinking that maybe they can move CJ McCollum to get something back to improve, you know, the chances of keeping Dame. And I do think that is like you mentioned, I think it's a pretty straight connection for both sides. I think CJ answers a lot of questions that, that, that Philly has, um, you know, that half court creation when we talked about Kyle Larry and sure the defensive shortcomings of CJ are something that may limit his value, but that would also, I think, be attractive to Daryl being that in a CJ for Ben framework, I think Portland has to give up more assets than Philly in that regard. So maybe that's an, a, appealing and intriguing for Daryl to use whatever comes back, whether it be a future first or something or a second round pick or whatever, you know, to, to actually keep furthering, improving Philly on the margins. Uh, Jake Fisher's with us. Uh, he's got a great sign and trade article over at Bleacher Report. Check him out uh, and check that out. Don't forget the book is Built to Lose, How the NBA's Tanking Era Changed the League Forever. And we saw two teams that, I don't know if you want to say tank, but the Bucks were not very good one year. They had the number two pick. They missed there. What about the Suns and what's next for them? Because I don't, I don't know, did they tank? Would you call them a tanking team? Yeah, Phoenix absolutely tanked. They were they were very detailed in the book, being that you know Ryan McDonough got hired right at the same time that Sam Hinkie did in Phoenix, and McDonough actually tanked. You know that made more tanky moves in that 2013 offseason before the 13 14 year, more than Sam. He traded for Emeka Okafor, who had a herniated disc in his back, and you know he was trying to target as many multiple first round picks in that 2014 class with Embiid and Wiggins and Jabari as he could. They just ended up being a better team than they thought. 
and you know, they got Devin Booker at 13 in 2015, but right back, you know, they slid down the standings when they move on from Goran Dragic and Eric Bledsoe and so on and so forth. And they get DeAndre Ayton in 2018, number one. And, and with those two guys, that's what drew the attention of Chris Paul. Chris Paul was not being traded to Phoenix unless the Suns had a real shot at signing him long term after this season. And the only reason they do so is because Devin Booker and DeAndre Ayton are there. That's the key to tanking. It's, it's getting superstars who can not only push you towards contention, but can also draw the eye of other players, other all star caliber guys to try to join them as well. All right, uh, Jake Fisher, make sure you guys check out the book. Uh, we got about uh, a month and a half left of this summer. I <laughs> encourage you to do it. Built to Lose, How the NBA's Tanking Era Changed the League Forever. And uh, check out Jake. Of course, you can follow him on Twitter at Jake L. Fisher. That's how you can find out how to get the book, Amazon, wherever you guys get books. I actually listen to uh, the book, actually, while I'm driving to work. That's how I'm hearing uh, the book. That's why I'm only halfway done so far. I only work five minutes from my office, but – uh, I got the uh, vacation time coming up. I will finish that book by the next time we talk, Jake. All right, man? Thank you, Mike. Always a pleasure to join you, man.